All right. Uh, Thanks, uh, Memberge team, for uh, inviting us. I think uh, I just wanted to appreciate Memberge for pulling the whole ecosystem together and uh, inviting us. So today, yeah, um, I'm Parag, and I run segment marketing at Arm, and storage is uh, one of the segments that uh, I'm responsible for. So today, I'm here to talk about uh, enabling CXL within the data center with Arm solutions. So from an agenda point of view, these are roughly the three things that I'm planning to cover. First, give ARM's view of disaggregation of uh, compute and memory. I think it's, it's very interesting to see uh, many companies kind of providing the same reasoning, so we also wanted to provide our reasoning. The second thing is uh, really from a product enablement point of view, discuss both host and device side. Uh, as some of you have, or many of you have seen, uh, we have been uh, shipping uh, ARM CPUs, or our partners have been shipping ARM CPUs on the server side as well. So we wanted to show where we are with that and how we can use similar things to enable products on the device side. And then finally, summarize. So from a market point of view, uh, disaggregation of compute and memory. I think the first thing that has been a common theme that we have heard is the inefficiency of uh, DRAM memory utilization. I think uh, pretty much uh, almost every speaker here has mentioned how much of DRAM is stranded. Uh, there have been some papers which I'll actually also show in the upcoming slides, but I think definitely this is one of the main reasons, uh, so no doubt about it. The second reason we also think why the disaggregation of compute and memory is happening is the memory channel bandwidth per core uh, needs. So uh, typically we have seen requirements of at least four gigabytes per core, and uh, recently you might have seen some products uh, uh, based on uh, ARM CPUs, uh, you have hit 128 core and above already. So if you do the math, uh, you're, you need at least 512 gigabyte or more moving forward. So this is the reason um, we also think why disaggregation of compute and memory is really uh, going to benefit. The third one, reducing the total cost of ownership. I think we have seen the math. Um, actually, um, I really appreciate the VMware folks' math here. Uh, where they had an exact number. Uh, we also think uh, the re reduction in total cost of ownership is one of the key drivers. I think estimates are 50% of your data center server costs are memory, so even if you get 20% reduction, then um, that translates to 10% overall data center server costs, which is huge, right, in millions of dollars. Uh, the last two reasons are uh, PCI speeds equaling single channel DRAM bandwidth. Again, this is if we just take pure theoretical numbers, uh, we do see that uh, a Gen 5 by 4 link kind of equates to that single channel DRAM bandwidth, but just pure theoretical numbers. And then the last one is uh, workloads are becoming more and more divergent, but that doesn't mean you create more and more types of servers. Uh, you want to kind of consolidate your, uh, I think in pure world terms, it's called SKUs. You want to have fewer SKUs, uh, as fewer SKUs as possible in a data center environment. Now, I think these are the two uh, websites or papers that we have also looked at. I think uh, in the talk in the morning from Microsoft, uh, I think this is the same chart uh, that they also showed this is a paper from them actually that they have uh, announced uh, a year or so ago. Um, the number of scheduled cores, as you can see, is uh, as you grow, the stranded memory goes up, which again converts to dollars. But I think the other thing we also wanted to show is the impact of, uh, or the slowdown in applications when Azure, I think, uh, tried to estimate how the applications would behave with additional latency. So in this paper specifically, they have shown what happens when they add 64 nanoseconds of latency to some of their applications. And you can see that uh, overall, almost 20% of workloads didn't show any impact due to the latency. Now, 
The latency that was added was uh, only 64 nanoseconds, but I think, uh, I think they were trying to show that there are few applications which I think could directly move to uh, tiered memory with their available. Similarly, I think the other example is from uh, Meta, where you can see for a web application, uh, there is huge capacity needs, but then on an allocation side, uh, it varies quite a bit. So I think this basically gives a view on how we are looking at it, uh, on how CXL can really enable these types of uh, uh, cases. Again, from a, if you look at it from a higher level, again, uh, this is how we view the market. Like you can see all the compute servers and the back end is all connected using Ethernet. And you can see, obviously, there is uh, Flash, whether it is TLC or QLC for your warm tier, and then obviously hard drives for a cold tier. But we really see a new disaggregated memory pool coming in into the server rack itself. I think we have seen some other examples from some other companies as well. And uh, this is really the game-changing thing that we are looking for. Um, and this one, I know, is a few years out. But I think this is how we see the whole industry evolving towards uh, in the future. Now, I think uh, we also wanted to split our our contributions to CXL from a host side and device side perspective. Uh, I wanted to start with the host side because uh, this is a recent announcement that we did, uh, specifically in September of 2022, where we announced our Neoverse V2 platform. Uh, this is the one that's highlighted here in um, kind of the orange box. So our V series is our maximum performance and optimal TCO product line. And uh, these, the Neoverse V2 has uh, our CPU core named Demeter, and it also has a mesh network which supports uh, CXL 2.0. So this was announced in September of 2022, and we expect our partners to be uh, shipping uh, products with uh, these soon. At the same time, as you can see in the rest of uh, the roadmap, uh, we have uh, CXL in other swim lanes as well. So when we announce our V3, um, it will have CXL 3.0 support. At the same time, when you look at our N series and E series, uh, we also are planning to have support over there. So it's not just the highest performance uh, and optimal TCO swim lane that we are enabling CXL, but we do expect uh, CXL to transition to all swim lanes in the future. So an example is the N2 that you see here. Um, if you use our CMN product, then it will support uh, CXL. Similarly, we'll continue supporting our N series next. And then our finally, our E series is used for efficient throughput. Um, we have A510, which has been released already. And this will also support CM, uh, CXL 2.0 and beyond, uh, provided you use our mesh network product. So I think we are uh, enabling CXL, and um, we are basically trying to say that uh, we have been investing in CXL for a few years on the host side, and you should see uh, our customer shipping uh, products with these capabilities uh, in the near future. The next one we also wanted to touch base is uh, UCIE. I think some of the speakers have brought this topic up as well. Um, for us, as you can see here, ARM has been driving technology leadership across these standards. Uh, we are on the board of UCIE and CXL. And the other key thing is um, Amber, I think, is shipped in billions of devices already. Um, we have enabled Amba Chai as the next standard. And we are also taking Amba Chai uh, to be the standard uh, to be used over UCIE or CXL. Uh, if you go higher levels up. So for us, the interest is we do see a future where uh, you can have a compute um, in a UCIE chiplet format, talking to CXL memory uh, devices, but they're using Ambachai at a high level. So that's the reason uh, we see. So you can really think about 
heterogeneous, uh, more and more varieties of heterogeneous compute. As you know, we, we are an IP provider. Uh, we are investing in these technologies to make sure uh, companies or customers understand what are the types of capabilities that they can enable in their products. So we, that's the, one of the reasons why um, we continue to be on the boards of uh, uh, these standards. Now, let me switch gears and talk about from a device side perspective, um, because I think, as you have seen, uh, we, we have a good play on the host side, uh, but also we also think uh, some of our IP products can be used on the device side as well. I think uh, many have seen uh, the two common cases, I think memory expansion and uh, memory pooling. As uh, many of you have already, I think they're product shipping and actually even in demo up, uh, upstairs. But specifically, I'm gonna focus uh, today on the memory pooling side from our side. And you can see from our side, uh, this is how we look at it from a memory pooling side. And uh, we feel like we are in a unique position to provide a CXL memory pooling solution as well. So we do have the mesh network that I just talked about on the host side. So for us, we could add, uh, actually we are adding capabilities uh, on the mesh network uh, for the device side as well, uh, so that the same mesh network could be used on the device side too. And obviously, uh, there is, we do see quite a bit of needs for CPUs for uh, fabric and SOC management. Um, so this is, uh, this is the reason why uh, we are continuing to uh, invest on the, on the device side as well. And obviously, if you have our host and device, uh, it's a, I think we could create an end-to-end optimized solution. Uh, so this is the reason why uh, we also have a view on the device side. Now, if you think about from a scale point of view, um, this is just a three by three kind of a thing, but we do see that it could expand to eight by eight or even more, uh, uh, depending on which node and all that. But we are really looking at uh, the TXL memory pooling will be deployed at scale in the future. And uh, this is how uh, we, we really view the market. Now, a lot of uh, customers ask about uh, economics behind the memory disaggregation. So we, we have done some internal estimates on our side. And again, I'll quote the VMware speaker because uh, his numbers were very closer to what we also estimated. Um, so definitely, I think it's clear that disaggregated memory is worth doing, but how much is the real benefit? So we have an example here where you have a baseline with few jobs compute and memory. So in this assumptions, we estimated you know, four gigabytes per core and let's say 25 to 50% of DRAM is stranded. With the first level of disaggregated memory, we think that you can easily get single digit better performance and TCO. So that's the 3% that you see here. Uh, this is purely by adding say memory expansion uh, to your uh, server and then you slightly reduce uh, the onboard server. So there, you can see the blue line there, uh, it's increasing, which means you're using more and more of your uh, memory. So less memory is stranded. But once you go to disaggregated memory with ideal tiering and all, so where you have optimal migration rates, migration algorithms, and tiering costs, this is where we really see a, a more than 20% better performance and uh, TCO. So I think this is the nirvana state that we would like to get to, but we do know that it's going to uh, take some time. Now, uh, as I said, right, we really appreciate uh, uh, members and team for inviting us. We do really see uh, an ecosystem play here. And I think one thing I do want to mention is ARM uh, has been uh, building ecosystems in many segments uh, in the past, but this is how we view the ecosystem. Obviously on the device, on the, on the lowest level, which is not here, we do have other IP providers as well. We are aware of that. But if you go one level up, we have the protocol analyzer companies like Teledyne and LaCroix. Uh, device side, all the memory folks, uh, Hynix, Samsung, Micron, 
and a couple of other uh, semiconductor vendors, microchip, Marvel, Elastics, Astera, Netlist, Intelliprop, and Montage. On the host side, obviously, ARM and Intel, AMD, et cetera. I think I do want to highlight uh, software companies because I think it's really everyone needs to come together. So uh, Memverge, VMware, uh, Giga.io, I think uh, they're all putting all their efforts to really make this happen. And obviously, uh, the cloud and uh, enterprise uh, providers. Now, uh, lastly, so I think we are, we are looking for partners to work with us. So if uh, anyone is interested, more than happy to chat. Um, we do want to be very uh, specific, saying that there are quite a few number of advantages on working with us on CXL. Firstly, as many of you have known, our technology is in development cycle. So uh, we have know-how in uh, coherent device technology because of our previous efforts in uh, CCIX or C6. And then we also have uh, like front row seats to many requirements that we get from our customers. And we have demonstrated leadership in uh, other segments. Some examples are uh, in automotive, we have an initiative called uh, Sophie that was launched last year and we have brought in many companies into that. Um, on the server side, there's, uh, there's an initiative called System Ready that was uh, brought in and many companies are part of it. So we have really, and, and on the IoT side, you know, we have uh, almost more than 15 million developers. So we really have built ecosystems over time. So that's the reason uh, we are interested to participate uh, in this. And lastly, you know, from an ecosystem enablement point of view, uh, we do participate in all major consortiums. Um, and we are, I would say, well versed in standardizing um, ecosystems. So this is the reason uh, we are more than happy to work with uh, the rest of the ecosystem. With that, uh, thank you so much. And yeah, thanks again for the opportunity.